Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Michelle. Thanks so much. It's a privilege to be here, and I'm not exactly in uniform anymore, so it's a little uncomfortable. It's been about a year and a half. Um, Eric and Tom have laid out challenges that are external to us, and from Tom's perspective, how internally he's concerned about the Navy. And I'm not privileged anymore to, to attend the uh, classified briefings in the Air Force uh, on what the status is, but I hope I can give some perspective on this and that uh, we all have our different duties. Eric laid out a fairly uh, comprehensive slide about the layers of challenge, and uh, the Navy is, is concerned by the sea, that domain, the Army, the land, the Air Force, space, air and cyberspace, and all of us work together in cyberspace to try to, to deal with the threats that we face. Uh, we could go into to some detail even about space and how philosophically we've tried not to militarize it. But as someone said about airplanes in World War I, um, they were just reconnaissance planes until someone pulled out the first gun and took a shot and said, oh, maybe there's something else we can do in the air. And likewise, that can happen in space and with anti-satellite weapons and nations who would want to put out our eyes. As dependent as we are on cyber, we're actually vulnerable, right? So if someone could put out our eyes or, or keep us from communicating with each other, it would really hurt our ability to operate as an air force or as a partner with our, our colleagues across the other services. And in fact, across the government, because we're on the same side. And there are a lot of instruments of national power that are not military, if we look at it that way. But we also are part of a democracy. In a democracy, we have laws about privacy, and we have rules about militarizing situations. The founders uh, were very concerned about quartering troops in our country. We had a little revolution about that. And so that explains why the federal military authorities aren't law enforcement. That's left to the National Guards of the states, because we're a republic, and that's how we operate. We don't have national police which is wonderful for the principles that we hold dear, but it's difficult when other actors want to get in between that. If the CIA detects something in cyber, they have to throw it over the transom to the FBI if it affects the internal United States affairs. So some of the things we hold dearest are, are a little bit um, blocking to some unitary efforts that other countries that don't care about privacy and freedom take on. So that's one of the complications for us. So all those threats that Eric described, that Tom talked about, are really crucial uh, for all of us in, in the air, um, especially on a practical level. And some of you know this, I think. There's actually a huge pilot shortage in the country right now, not just for military pilots, but on airlines, right? We had a huge retirement a few years ago. Some of you are executives in airlines and can explain it better than I, but it's, it's real. And so it forces us, as Tom said, to think differently and innovate and how we get pilots, how we train them. We can't take so long to do it. We can use simulation more. Uh, we can be more creative. But in that halcyon period of the 90s when we thought we had a peace dividend, we also closed air training bases. So the base where I went to pilot training, Williams Air Force Base in Gilbert, Arizona, is not an Air Force base anymore. In fact, I think they were driving that automated car around at Chandler, really nearby. So what have we done? We haven't had a, a strategy. So these are the kinds of challenges we face. Um, but I think, you know, maybe my background is so eclectic that I owe you an explanation, you know, <laughs> explain myself. And maybe I can go into a little history of how we got here, how I got here, and in the course of the telling, um, maybe make some sense of it, or at least the this, this sense that, that I see. So if I could have my colleagues in the back throw up. I'm going to be very low-tech here, so I think we're, we're going to be very complimentary. We had some really cool, high-tech um, presentations from my colleagues from the Army and the Navy, and then we had these beautiful automations. And these are going to be, <laughs> on the other hand, since I'm in the MBA now, I don't have aides to do my presentations, so this is my stick man version. Of, uh, of PowerPoint, if you'll forgive me. So this is the Imagination Solutions Conference, and so I thought I'd show you a picture of myself and my dog in about 1970. Um, you may ask, why was the dog 
on the roof with me, and it's, I'll be honest with you, it's because the horse wouldn't do it. I used to climb up on the rooftops. Uh, this happens to be in Illinois, to be technical, if we go to the GPS coordinates. But I grew up in Iowa. My dad was a farmer and moved to town and worked for a farm service company. And so I was sort of a rural latchkey kid, the youngest by many years, and so on my own, left my own devices. And I'd crawl up on the barn roofs, um, and the hog barns were easier because they're lower, but this was not a hog barn. And I could see, you know, in Iowa, you can almost see the curvature of the earth over the sea of corn and soybeans and the big horizon and the big sky. And I used to wonder, how can I get in, in that big world? Um, my window to the world was a library, not the internet. And those are the, that's just how it was. And I couldn't know what was happening really in the 70s. That in 1973, the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, had her first uh, equal rights case, Frontero versus Richardson. I didn't know that Frontero was an Air Force officer who asked kind of a crazy question. Why am I not paid the same as the men? Well, because women in the armed forces weren't in the same promotion scale, and in fact didn't have the privileges. A woman could not have children. She could not marry a man with children. If she did, she had to get out. Um, you were not on the same promotion scale. She could not go to pilot training. I didn't know that in 1975, Gerald Ford signed legislation that changed the status of women in the armed forces and opened up the possibility to even attend a service academy. So I entered in 1977 in the second co-ed class. Not everybody was thrilled about that, and so I got my first uh, awakening into hate mail and being told how much I was lowering standards and uh, how dare I ruin an academy. And it was really a shock tactic that was a crucible that actually helped me as a leader later because I learned early what it's like to be treated like other. And I may not know everyone's journey, but I know what that feels like, and it helps me empathize better with my colleagues and, and go forward. I didn't know that Parliament changed the language of Cecil, Wilde's, uh, Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes' will uh, to take out the words manly quality so that women could be Rhodes scholars. So I was a Rhodes scholar, and I went to Oxford in 1981, um, in about the fourth class uh, that was co-ed. So I didn't know. <laughs> I was just trying to imagine how to go out into the world. And there was a career day at high school, and I hope that all of you can be part of these opportunities for kids to have them understand what's possible. Even if someone that doesn't look like them is in a job that maybe I could do that. I, hopefully there'd be someone who looks like them, but if not, they could at least say, I could have a chance. So a career day in Spencer, Iowa, in about 1976, um, someone from the Air Force Academy talked about what's possible. And I did not realize also at the time that we were in fact poor, <laughs> because when you have food and can go to JC Penney's when, when needed, uh, that you're doing okay, um, we didn't have the resources to go to college. So I was a good athlete, I was a good student, I was a National Merit Scholar, and I thought, I can serve my country for a while, it'll be like outward bound, right? So <laughs> If I can do that, anything else will fall into place. And when I went to the academy, I had wonderful teachers, 10 inspiring teachers for every one detractor. And people mentored me out of my comfort zone because that's how you learn. You don't learn in safe spaces. I mean, safe in terms of respect, yes, but not safe in terms of ideas. You only learn by being uncomfortable and having to do something new. And so I've spent most of my life learning to be uncomfortable. And, and gaining from it. I was inspired to be a pilot by an Army helicopter pilot who'd been a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And he saw me in the hallway one day, said, I can't make my voice go low enough, I'll try. Cadet Johnson, I have seen you play basketball. You are a warrior. Notice he didn't say I was fast or graceful or accurate. He said I was a warrior. I did get all the loose balls. But, uh, but he said, why aren't you flying? And I, I said, I didn't know. I didn't, I, I, even though it was the Air Force Academy, I, I wore glasses, so I thought um, your eyes had to be perfect. Mine were close and close enough, and so I wound up being able to do that. And I, I went to Oxford. I was an undergraduate in operations research, so technically an engineer. The core curriculum all this, of all the service academies is 50% humanities and 50% STEM. And that's important for this conference to what Tom Modley just talked about, and frankly what Eric Wesley talked about before. If we want to think differently, where does creativity come from? 
not just STEM, not just humanities, both. If you're technically cognizant, you're not intimidated by the math or the engineering, you, you're inspired by it. But if you're going to lead humans, you need to understand the human condition and understand history. How did we get here? Why did the founders make the choices they made? And yes, they were dead white men, but they did okay. And we've been able to, via a civil war, perfect the Constitution by expanding rights as our nation grows, perfect the Constitution. And to understand where that comes from gives us our shared sense of purpose. And so it really mattered to me a lot then and when I was the superintendent of the academy, that core curriculum, not stem at the expense of the humanities or vice versa. And I'm glad that some of the earlier speakers alluded to that. We need to know what we believe in. And that came from that opportunity. Now, in the early 80s, women were not allowed to fly all aircraft. We could fly tankers, trainers, or transports, and uh, not fighters or bombers, um, because that didn't happen until the 90s. So I've been living on this sort of bow wave of change as opportunities come up. So the kinds of airplanes I flew were these. Um, the KC-135 uh, KC is, is getting ready to air refuel at 141. I spent most of my time in 141s. That means cargo airplanes that we're on the ground in Africa, uh, Asia, South America, Europe, uh, a little bit in the Pacific. I didn't fly as much there. But I had a crew of people, four to 10 people, where we did cargo in Khartoum, um, Nairobi, uh, Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean, through Saudi Arabia, where when I went to dinner after the flight, I had to be served last and wear a scarf over my head um, in a different country, which I think we've, we've had to kind of contend with as we work across the world. Uh, the KC-10, the three-engine jet, every feeling a fighter. I was a squadron commander uh, in that aircraft, and I spent most of my time in the 90s in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, because, as, again, as my colleagues alluded to, our forces didn't come home after Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We stayed. We flew Southern Watch. Uh, watching Saddam Hussein. We deployed constantly through the 90s. So when you hear the services weary, it's because our people from all the services have been deployed constantly since the end of the Cold War, uh, when the so-called peace dividend. The giant C-5 you see on the ramp there, I was an instructor in that aircraft when I commanded a group that trained all the, all the air crews on all big jets and air mobility command. And then on the other side, the C-17, you might recommend, uh, recognize it, replaced the 141, and it's been a workhorse all along. So here's the weird connection with the MBA. What on earth does that have in common with being in the Air Force? Well, a lot, as it turns out. Referees are professional people. They have to study a, a deep, uh, not just rule book, but implementation manner and get the experience to be able to know what to do on a moment's notice, in a bang, bang, play, make a decision. It's not that they're blind. You say, Ralph, you're blind. No, they see fine. <laughs> it's processing cognitively what rules apply to this thing in this moment with seven foot, 300 pound people running around at high rates of speed. And a lot of times, people don't know what generals do. I mean, I find a lot of times now they'll say, well, the military and you military people. And I go, what do you think we do? Just order people around? And they said, yes. You just tell them what to do and they do it. And that would be awesome. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work that way. Commanders, generals, organize, train, and equip people with specialized knowledge to do really hard jobs. Now, I will say, except for six months at the beginning of my tenure at the Air Force Academy, I didn't understand hate mail the way our referees do. And so I'll make a pitch now, and I'll make one later. Please tell your kids to be nice to your grandkids' refs. You know, we're losing referees across the country. People don't want to do it. People say vile things to them. They hate them. Guess what? They're like real human beings, and they have families. They're a lot like air crews, in fact. And my analogies of being a pilot on a crew having to have this body of knowledge, having to make decisions in a moment, hope you don't have to be Sullenberger and land a plane on the river, but hope you could do it if the, the, the situation called for it. They get that. Uh, NBA referees, and there are about 70 of them right now, we have some injured, work uh, over between 60 and 70 games over a 10-month period, so they're on the road constantly. 
and studying, and after every game, they're graded by several entities. And we needed to bring together the program that scouts them, develops them, evaluates them, because it's been kind of oral, and right now the NBA is so global that we need to codify it, to have actual processes and, and make it more rigorous and, and, and write down what the criteria are and capture the mission, all the kinds of things that I know how to do, and I can spell basketball, so it worked, it worked out. But I think what I've also learned in my retirement is we can see beyond our stovepipes. There are things that just apply. That's why Jim Collins and Simon Sinek and Marty Linsky write books on leadership and change management, because regardless of whether you're in uniform or not, there are certain things that prevail with people and organizations. They need to understand, why are we doing this? What's our shared purpose? What's my role in this? What standards do I need to meet? Do you care about me? Those things matter in, for leaders across the board. So I bring it up with the airplanes because it really, that's the connection in a, in a kind of a strange way, but it makes sense to me now. <laughs> so along the way, um, I taught actually political science with Tom Modley at the Air Force Academy when, in the time he talked about. And uh, he had that approach to teaching. Mine was at the end of class, I would ask him, do you want to talk for five more minutes or do you want to do push-ups? And to show you how unpopular I was, they would rather do push-ups. But, <laughs> but, uh, but being part of education and learning has been really important to me as well. Um, I wish I had had that job after this one, um, but I was fortunate enough to be uh, selected to be the Air Force aide to the President of the United States for President George H.W. Uh, Bush. Uh, for the last year of his, his uh, term and the first year of President Clinton's. And so this is a picture of me at Camp David on uh, Christmas of 1992. And he was asking me, where are you going to celebrate Christmas? And I said, well, my husband and I, my, my husband and I had been married um, two years at that point. Um, I said, well, we declared a date in February Christmas because I've got to go to Mogadishu tomorrow to advance your trip to Somalia. And I will add that the Secret Service used to ask me, how come you're always in Minsk and Mogadishu and the Coast Guard aides in Paris and Prague? And I said, because he's the scheduler. But anyway, <laughs> but uh, it was a real privilege to work for, for President Bush. And when I came into the job, of course, because of the newness of women to some of these roles, um, there's a retired three-star army general who'd fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And when I met him, I thought, retired three-star generals look pretty old. Now, now I don't think so, but... Um, but he, he brought up a couple of things with me that really stuck. And one um, was about Barbara uh, Tuckman speaking to army generals in 1972. She's a famous historian, especially around uh, World War I era. And she talked to the generals and she said two things. One, that command, senior command in battle is a unique role in that it requires an equal exercise of judgment on the physical, intellectual, and moral scale. And so when you're carrying uh, the football, which is about the order of succession and the 25th Amendment and the nuclear codes to connect the president to the National Command Authority, Having a sense of that really matters. And again, going back to why are we doing this? What do we stand for? What's the morality of this? We could do it. Should we do it? What's the best thing to do? And that the courage that's required to do that isn't just physical courage, it's moral courage. And General Treffery said to me, and he would know, that when the bullets are flying, training and adrenaline take care of a lot of things. If you ask a Medal of Honor winner, to a person, they'll say, anyone else would have done it, I didn't think about it. I don't know about anybody else doing it, but they didn't think about it, they just did it. And we're grateful to them. It's harder in the cold light of day to look somebody in the eye and say, that didn't work out so well. You need to not do that anymore. I don't stand for that. That is moral courage. And so as we think about artificial intelligence or networked, airmen and sailors and marines and soldiers. How do you bring about moral courage? How do you teach that? Does that come from literature and drama? Does that come from just training? 
it's the combination of all those things. So I think I've lost the, the I've got a couple more for you. So this was my last day working for President Clinton. That's my husband. That was 26 years ago. We were much younger and cuter then. Um, he, is, he is phenomenal. So we've been married 28 years now. And our twins are 16. So you can tell we didn't live together too much for those first 12 years. Um, and uh, I was very grateful for this, for this opportunity to, to serve at that, that, that level. Again, sometimes I don't think people think about what generals do. And I was a major then, and I went back to flying. Um, and then I had, as a general officer, other opportunities. So I was on the joint staff, and I had had, as a part of the up or out personnel system, which I'll mention in a little bit, every two years I was moving on to someone else, and I, something else, and I asked the head of Air Force personnel, I said, I feel like I'm cramming for the final every two years. I was head of personnel for Air Mobility Command for two years. I was head of Air Force Public Affairs for two years. I said, could I do something normal? So they put me on the joint staff, they put me in charge of <laughs> detainee policy at Guantanamo Bay. I said, great, thanks, that's awesome. <laughs> really love that. But that wasn't really, actually a Marine three-star called me and he goes, no, we, we want you to do something else now. We want you to help start Cyber Command. I said, I can barely log into the computer. But that wasn't the point. What I had learned was to bring people together, especially at, get people at the table to bring the experts together to try to accomplish something greater. In one of my um, meetings I had when I was a one-star general, I was with the comptroller of the, uh, the Pentagon, of the Department of Defense, Mr. Hale, and then Dr. Christine Fox, who was basically, there was a real person um, that modeled the M Kelly McGillis character in Top Gun, and that was Dr. Christine Fox. She doesn't look exactly like Kelly McGillis, but she's tall and smart, and that's awesome. But the two of them asked me, they said, what are you? You're like a general officer with a lowercase g, because I had this eclectic background. But what I picked up along the way is how to bring people together. And Dr. Fox noted that you can bring experts in and say, you are the expert of every detail of this. Now, how would you organize yourselves to maximize your impact and inter interact with others? And very few experts at that level of depth can really do that. That's a different thing. But if you can get them to the table, they can make sure you're not making um, foolish uh, short-term decisions, but they also then can be optimized because you pull them together. And so that's what we did. So I spent a lot of time at the NSA explaining to intelligence people that cyber can be operational, not just for intelligence gathering. That you don't have to be covert up until the, you know, if you're about ready to drop a bomb on them in two seconds. Or you might need to be. But this is the different kind of tactic of warfare and operations that you need to think about. It's not just intelligence, it's operational. And then in NSA's case, they actually do a lot with industry and business for cyber defense and security. And, and, and so they're not the bad guys they're portrayed to be, but it was a real privilege to get to work with them. Following that job, I wound up being head of policy for U.S. Transportation Command and spent a lot of time in Central Asia making sure the trains could get through Kazakhstan to Afghanistan. Again, what do I know about trains? But people are people. And you haven't lived until the Minister of Transportation of Kazakhstan has scolded you through a translator because someone used the word um, 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 retroactive. We wanted to get stuff out of Afghanistan, not just to go in. They thought that meant we were insulting them. So it took about 45 minutes to work through that. But, but again, bringing people together to say, what are we trying to do? What's your role in it? And how does this work? And so my last assignment before I was the superintendent of the academy was at NATO. And I was the two-star general, and I worked for the four-star commander, Admiral Stavridis. But I did a lot of the legwork and was his operations officer. So from Afghanistan to the counter-piracy in the Horn of Africa, to counter-terrorism in the Med, to um, peacekeeping in the, in the Balkans, and then air policing over the Baltics. We had quite, quite a bit going on, and especially air operations over Libya in 2011. But this picture's in the Kremlin. And the Russians are very worried about Afghanistan because they didn't want terrorism and drugs coming out of there. And Admiral Stavridis had promised the Russians we'd brief them quarterly. And they were as dubious about me because I was an airman as because I was a woman. And the people at NATO figured out I was just the type A American 
at a certain point, and I would yell at them just like anybody else would. <laughs> um, but to have the privilege to go to Moscow to brief the uh, General uh, Postnikov Streltsov, who was a, the, dep like the vice chairman of their general staff. So I had my, my British colonel and my German lieutenant colonel and my American colonel and a translator and a Norwegian admiral with me in the Kremlin, and it was the same thing. It was the same thing to be able to explain, why are we here, what does it affect you, and to be very professional about it, and still be that kid who sat on the roof of the barn. Um, kind of shows the trajectory of a life that maybe people aren't that familiar with. And so finally, so I wound up at the academy, and again, with the core curriculum 50-50, we still have people really pushing, you know, STEM, STEM, STEM. But what my counterparts have told you is the world's changing, and we have to think, change the way we think. And the millennials and now Gen X, just as people have said earlier today, really care. If you explain why you're doing something and have them be part of that, they will pull themselves together and come up with very creative solutions. And so we tried very hard there to pull that together and have education and training happen there so that they'd be more prepared to go out and serve in the field. And so, for instance, if they're building satellites, which they do, it wasn't just the astronautical engineers building it. We had the business majors and... Now, granted, this is the Air Force Academy, not Wharton, so we're not, they're not that specialized, but to bring a different thought process, management, because that's how you work in teams to get things done. You don't do technology in isolation, and so we, we really built toward that, and it was just a real honor. I loved doing that. I miss doing that. I love being around the, the young people and uh, to see what they can do. It's phenomenal. So I'll, I'll leave the pictures there. But as I retired and then came out into the world and the NBA called me and said, would you come and do this? It was like, okay, you know, the colleges weren't beating my doors down to, to come out there. Um, and I called Greg Popovich, who was an Air Force Academy graduate, coach of the Spurs, and said, why, are they, why would they want me to do this? He said, because the NBA stands for something. They stand for social justice. They want talent wherever it comes. And they're trying to, you know, to grow and to professionalize what they do. And so I've been shuttling between New York and Colorado Springs with, with our kids, who are now 16, um, and they're band kids uh, for the last year and a half. And I started reading again. You know how you start reading the books that have been piled up for a while? And I went back to Barbara Tuckman and was reading about the guns of August and the war plans of, of World War I and the zeitgeist of the 1890s. And it's not the same as now, but think about it. The societal changes, technology changes, um, what was happening in the world, the um, militarism of some of the nations, um, social movements, the changing of the composition of parliament in England, allowed the, the world to stumble into a world war, a conflagration that they thought would be over in a month, and it took millions of lives, they lost a generation. We have to be mindful and not allow ourselves to fall into that again, and to think about what's required. Uh, Barbara Chuckman spoke to Army generals in 1972 and talked about courage and judgment, and to be able to entertain different thoughts in your mind at the same time, and all the interdependencies of them, so that this technology that we're developing can serve our aims, not vice versa. One of the things that troubled me as I learned more about cyber on the joint staff and then and, uh, at the academy was, think about this a little bit, and I'm not trying to vilify Zuckerberg, but think about what he said 10 years ago. There's a psychology and a sociology to the technology. And we sort of naively allowed someone to change our behavior. Tom Modley brought up the Russians trying to, and, and also Eric, I think, to interfere with our elections, to change our behavior to cast doubt on facts, to cast doubt on data. If our data becomes unbelievable, what does that do to our, our markets, our business markets, the stock market? What's it do to navigation in an aircraft that's part of a network? This is really key stuff. And when, when I started as a superintendent, the chief of staff told me, make your, this program relevant for this generation in the modern profession of arms. And the modern profession of arms is a networked joint that means we work together since Goldwater Nichols, 1986, except in Washington where we fight for resources. But in the field, we work together. 
we have allies. Allies matter. So even people who aren't allies, the Russians, but the allies in NATO mattered. We work with them. We have interoperability with them to, to come up with a defense on common interests, the modern profession of arms. And we have to explore ideas about valor. People behind a screen in Nevada holding a target at bay in Afghanistan don't just do it for a day and then go home to the pool with their kids. They'll track the pattern of life of a bomb maker for months and creates new challenges for people and their mental resilience. So we had, for instance, an RPA, a remotely piloted aircraft. By the way, the Air Force calls them remotely piloted because they're not really unmanned. It takes about 40 or 50 analysts for every orbit, so we don't call them unmanned anymore. <laughs> we call them, they're remotely piloted. One, one operator was following this bomb maker for months, but he, the bomb maker would always put one of his kids in the back of his motorbike before he went over to the bomb making place. And finally, one day, a uh, leader said, you know, we're going to have to take him out. We can't wait for him to not have his kid there. And one of the young operators said, I, I can't do it. I've been learning this family for months. And they brought someone else in, and thankfully, the one day, the guy didn't put his kid on the back of the bike, they could take him out. How do we measure valor in this setting? Is it proximity to harm, or is it like from movies that you have, you have uh, one lone hero? No, this is, a, this is a challenge mentally and morally for our future leaders, and that's a challenge for us. So I hope you can get a sense of what our challenges are that we face, that many of them, they're existential in some ways, many of them are technological, a lot of them really test our fiber. Every one of the services has a code of values. Uh, in the Air Force, we say integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do. The other services have different words, but it's the same thing. Can we trust each other in this sacred uh, duty that we have? I know what I believe. I think as a nation, we all need to find some ground where we can disagree respectfully and have that be part of what we believe too. Thank you for your time today.